This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Olivier Siboni, who is a professor at HSC Paris, the leading business school in Europe now, apparently, according to the rankings, and also uh, the author of a number of books. Most recently, uh, this book right here, uh, Noise, um, A Flaw in Human Judgment, co-authored with uh, Danny Kahneman and Cass Sunstein, um, and then also a couple other books including this one right here, you're about to make a terrible mistake, which uh, I, I, I noticed is not called how to make better decisions, but how to avoid making horrible decisions. And then <laughs> co-authored uh, a while back, this one called Cracked It, um, how to solve big problems and sell solutions like top strategy consultants. And I should mention that uh, Olivier was a strategy consultant for many years before entering um, academia. Welcome, Olivier. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Greg. Now, I have to say, the most recent book, uh, which just came out, Noise, uh, co-authored with uh, two other of my favorite authors, this book is really, uh, it's its kind of a, a masterpiece. I mean, it, it really is a, a one of those books that you read, one of my favorite types of books, the type of book that takes uh, a whole bunch of stuff that you've, you've already, you already knew about um, from different studies, uh, adds in a few others that you didn't know about, but architects it, organizes it, sequences it in, in an entirely new way, right? Which illuminates things which you had thought were disparate, but in fact are kind of examples of this overarching phenomenon. Uh, and, uh, and so I was, I was just kind of blown away by how you organized all of this into this central theme, which is, which is noise. And for people who teach data science or, or statistics, right? You know, we always start our, our class with the, the diagram that you begin the book with, right? Which is about the, the bullseye and, you know, uh, dispersion around the bullseye or kind of, you know, off to the corner of the, of the bullseye. And we talk about, uh, bias and we talk about noise. And after discussing both of these and the problems associated with both of these, when you move over into the judgment and decision-making literature, we focus almost entirely and exclusively on the, the bias as, as a source of error. And, and you, you say that, um, bias is the star of the show and that we've been neglecting noise. Um, now, even though in data science, we, we spend an awful lot of time uh, talking about noise in the judgment and decision-making literature, we, we really have kind of given it short shrift. So why is that? Uh, and and is did this, oh, that's, was, this a realiza all, that, you know, was this a realization you came to kind of gradually or or have you always kind of wanted this yeah i mean well first of all thanks for the kind words and this is a brilliant summary what you just said i mean i i wish i had positioned it this way earlier because we are getting a lot of you know comments from uh, data scientists who tell us hey what's all the big fuss we know about noise we teach about noise all the time you know it's not news and as you pointed out, the, the, the new news here, which is not new, but as, uh, exactly as you said, the, the, the new way to organize old ideas is to say that there is noise in judgments, mm -hmm. not just noise in data, noise in events, noise in the world, which is what data science is mostly concerned about. But there is also noise in judgments as opposed to bias in judgments. Mm -hmm. And taking this idea that noise is distinct from bias, which is very familiar to data scientists and bringing it into the field of judgment and decision making where, as you said, there has been a lot of focus on bias and no focus on noise at all, uh, has been what we've been trying to do here. And really, the, to, to, to now answer your question, what got us intrigued is that, it, Especially Danny, obviously, has been working on bias his entire life. I mean, and, and, and I, I've been working on bias my entire academic life, but it's about five years old as opposed mm -hmm. to Danny's life, which is 50 years old, his mm -hmm. academic life. So, you know, we've been focusing a lot on what people have in common in the mistakes they make, what we can explain, what is the size of the effects that we can account for. And we've been treating 
all the rest, everything that we cannot explain, everything that we cannot account for, all the individual differences between people as opposed to what they have in common, as the background against the figure. And we've been treating it as something uninteresting and not worthy of discussion. And in fact, when you look at error as what you're trying to minimize, noise makes as much of a difference as does bias. In fact, in many cases, it makes more. So what led um, first Denny and then me to that realization is a couple of studies, and we, we, we give the example of the study in an insurance company, where there is probably no bias on average. You know, the, the, the company is probably not overpricing or underpricing its policies, but if some of its policies are overpriced and others are underpriced, it is still making a lot of bad decisions. It doesn't have a bias, it doesn't have an average error, but if there is noise in the decisions that it's making, it's making a lot of serious, damaging, costly mistakes. And that's what the evidence suggests. So basically, that's the topic that we've been looking at. And initially, we weren't sure that there was a real topic because we, we were conditioned, like so many of us, to think that what matters is the average error, the bias, and that you know, small, that other errors must be small and anyway will cancel out. It turns out when you look at the data, that is not the case. Noisy errors, errors that are not explained by shared biases between people, are much larger than we think and much more consequential than we think in just about every domain that we've looked at. So we, we realized it was actually a big deal. So is it possible that people in disciplines like finance, right, when you know, they're examining choices, um, you know, they have a tendency to focus on, on the average and, and they say, well, okay, so, you know, you're, you're wrong in this direction. Sometimes you're wrong in that direction sometimes. Uh, but when, you know, at the end of the day, what matters is if, you know, you're, you're, you're more wrong than you're more right than wrong. And, and at the end of the day, when you, when you add up all of these, uh, these, these errors, um, you wind up making pretty good decisions on, on average. Um, I remember once, uh, I was uh, talking with Richard Posner, this was probably 25 years ago, where, where he said kind of the same thing about biases. And I, I don't think he would uh, agree with that claim today that, you know, biases cancel each other out. But, but you can kind of make a more plausible claim that in the world of noise, uh, these errors cancel each other out. And so, so why is it that they don't cancel each other out? And, and why is it important that even if on average you're making pretty good decisions, you're, you're still going to wind up making some pretty bad decisions uh, at the end of the day, which will ultimately, um, you know, harm your, your, your overall decision making. So this is a very important point and actually a very simple one if you step back and you look at it the right way. Suppose that you have a company that is making hiring decisions. And it has a gender bias. It, you know, it's, it has 100 recruiters and it's 100 recruiters are all men and they're all biased in favor of men. Let's make that assumption. Obviously, the outcome is going to be a gender, big gender bias, a severe gender bias in the hiring policy of the company. Now, suppose that another company has 50 male recruiters who are biased in favor of men, but 50 recruiters who are biased in favor of women. I'm not saying this is a frequent case. In fact, I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist. But let's assume for the sake of argument that that mm -hmm. is the case. You would see the outcome of the recruiting process of that company as being entirely unbiased. You would see that on average, it doesn't have any distortion in the, in the gender of the people that it's hiring compared to the people who are applying. But it would be making a lot of mistakes because the 50 male biased recruiters who would be uh, you know, not hiring a lot of competent women and vice versa for the recruiters who are biased in favor of women. So when we're concerned about errors, not about the averages, it matters a lot that we don't have noise. Another example, which is less imaginary, much more concrete and tangible and much more consequential is uh, we take the example of the judicial system where there are very large differences between judges looking at the same case. Now, if one judge sentences the same person to seven years in prison and another to three years in prison, and you think that on average that person deserves five years in prison, 
it's not a good thing that half of the time that person is going to get three years and half of the mm -hmm. time the same person having committed the same crime is going to get seven. That can't be right. So being right on average for a system, for an organization is desirable, of course, but it's not enough. Having no bias is better than having a bias. But noise and bias are completely separate, independent sources of error, mm -hmm. and you actually need to reduce both. Now, I, I think what some people might find surprising is that um, when we're trying to identify whether we're subject to uh, a bias or subject to noise in our judgment, um, data scientists would say it's very difficult to identify a bias because you need to have some understanding of the ground truth, but it's, it's actually very easy to identify uh, noise because you're going to wind up getting different outcomes with the same set of facts, right? If you run it through this, this process uh, repeatedly. And, and so if it's easier to identify noise th than bias, why haven't we directed more of our efforts towards the, the elimination of noise in, in the process? Um, is it in fact easier to identify noise? I mean, I, th I think you, you talk about it how, is. um, if you're making single judgments, it's very, very difficult to know. Um, you'd have to run yes. some kind of hypothetical counterfactual simulation, right? Yeah, in, in a single decision, is very hard to see noise, but in a system, in, in anything that makes repeated decisions in, say, the judicial system or the insurance company that prices a lot of insurance policies or in uh, a hiring organization that makes a lot of hiring decisions, you, it is actually difficult to establish the presence of bias because you need to know what the truth is, as you pointed out, but it's actually quite easy to do a test of noise, what we call a noise audit, which means to give the same case to a number of different judges, a number of different people, and to check how different their judgments are. Whenever you do that, in our experience, you find that, of course, there is a difference. You expect there to be a difference because it's, it's the definition of a matter of judgment that you expect that there will be some difference between reasonable people. When we say something is a matter of judgment, what we mean is that it's okay for reasonable people to disagree. But when we say something is a matter of judgment, we also mean that it's okay for reasonable people to disagree within limits. We do not expect mm -hmm. wide disagreements between reasonable people. And what you find when you do a noise audit is in fact a very wide disagreement. The, the, the most striking example we have is the insurance company where we, we asked the leaders of the company you know, how much of a difference would you expect between two of these qualified underwriters who are applying the same rules and the same techniques and have been trained in the same way in the same company to do the same work and who are assumed to be interchangeable? And they said, well, of course, you know, it's still a matter of judgment. We, we would be fine or you know, we would tolerate a 10% difference on average between two underwriters. When we did the audit, the difference was actually 55%, more than five times larger than what was expected. So the issue here is not that there is a difference between people making judgments. It's not the existence of noise. It's the amount of noise. It's the, the magnitude of those differences. Mm -hmm. It's actually fairly easy to measure once you set out to do it, which raises the question you, 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 you asked me a minute ago. How come we didn't notice this before? Why don't we notice noise in those systems, despite the fact that, in fact, whenever you, you start to measure it, it's actually very severe? And there are two reasons to that, which are, I think, in, in themselves quite intriguing. The first one is that we don't, as individuals, put ourselves in other people's shoes very often. We, if, if I'm an underwriter and I've been spending several hours setting a price for an insurance policy, I can't really imagine that the guy sitting in the office next door would, you know, walk through exactly the same steps and arrive at a conclusion that is 55% higher or 55% lower than the number I've arrived at. That's kind of mind boggling. And so... I tend to suppress that idea by simply not thinking about it, by simply assuming, this is the, the, the naive realism assumption, 
by simply assuming that there is a truth out there and I see it and other people, unless they are somehow mistaken or, or corrupt in some kind of way, should be seeing the truth in the same way that I'm seeing it. And, you know, I'm, I'm taking the example of the underwriter. I don't, I'm, I don't mean to pick on insurance people. They're great people. We, we are all guilty of the same thing. If I grade an essay as, as a professor, I will grade that essay. I will, of course, realize that you know, the, my, my colleague might say, you know, this is a B plus, not a B, or this is an A minus, not a B plus. But I really can't imagine how someone would give that essay a D if I give it an A. It's very, very hard to figure. And yet mm -hmm. that happens. So this is the first reason. The second reason, which is, I think, even more important, is that organizations do a really, really good job of sweeping noise under the rug, of making sure noise remains unnoticed. Mm -hmm. Organizations crave consensus. They crave harmony. They, they, they want to get to decisions and to action, and to get to decisions and to actions, you need to resolve disagreements. And the fastest way to resolve disagreements is not to let them appear in the first place. I, we, we have a story in the book, which, was, which we heard from a great psychologist called Nathan Kunzel, who whose work we, 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 we cite a lot. Um, and Kunzel was working with the admissions department of a university. And they were you know, grading the, the essays that, that, that the students were writing in, in their applications. Mm -hmm. And they had two people grade each essay. But the second person who graded each essay saw the grade that was put by the first person. And so Kunzel told them, as, as we would have told them if we had worked with them, that's actually not a good practice. You should hide that first grade and you should make sure that the two grades are independent mm -hmm. of each other so that one is not influencing the other. And their answer was, oh, yeah, of course, that's how we used to do it. But we disagreed so much that we changed the system to what we're doing now. And this tells you, you know, quite strikingly something that most organizations would in fact agree with, which is that they value harmony over the quality of the decision. They care more about not being at each other's throats because they have completely different points of view about an applicant than about having those two different points of view, taking the time to resolve that disagreement or figuring out a way to resolve that disagreement mm -hmm. to everybody's satisfaction and actually using this variety of points of view as a way to improve the quality of decisions. So there's an individual, long answer to your question. There's an individual level answer and there's an organizational level answer. And these two things conspire to make noise more discreet than it should be. Well, that process that you describe, um, and, and kind of the, the bias cascades that you mentioned in, in the, the group decision-making part of the book, um, you know, these are just a way of kind of papering over what, what is ultimately noise. So for instance, if the, the, you have a group of people who are examining this applicant, um, if, uh, examiner A is the first one to examine the applicant, um, then you're going to get a different outcome if examiner B examines that, uh, uh, applicant, but you'd never know, uh, because of this kind of fake harmony that you use to paper over the, the disagreements. I found that discussion, you know, very powerful. I certainly see that a lot in organizations. I think probably individuals, uh, try to make themselves consistent in, in a similar way. Right. Um, but individuals, um, when they're, when they're doing this, they're probably not doing it for the same reasons as, as organizations do, do individuals try to paper over their inconsistencies in, in a similar way? You mean inconsistencies within the individual, within, you, know, you mean people trying to maintain consistency in their own decisions and their own judgments? Yeah. Or maybe let's, let's backtrack. We'll, we'll hold, table that question for a second and, and get back to the different sources of of, uh, of noise. Um, so what I found really interesting in this book is, is how you decomposed noise into kind of different types of, of noise. Um, and you begin by recounting one of the earlier, uh, earliest versions of a noise audit, which is the one 
that resulted in the sentencing guidelines, right? And there the, the emphasis was on how different judges would uh, adjudicate cases in, in very different ways. And so this was an effort to eliminate that variability across judges. Um, that's one type of, of noise. Could you talk about kind of the different types of noise? I love the yeah. diagrams, how you, you, you decompose it, actually, uh, the noise into different, different it's types. Two types of noise rolled into one, the one you just described. So we, we need mm -hmm. to, 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 to double click on this a little bit. When you say different judges are going to pass different judgments on the same case, and this study was done by giving little vignettes to 208 federal judges and you know, asking them you know, how many years in prison and what, how many years of probation and what fine would you sentence this person to, and the differences are huge. So the assumption that we all have when we read this is, oh, of course, some judges are more severe than others, and some are more lenient than others. There are, you know, there are hanging judges, and there are bleeding hard judges. There are, by the way, mm. Republican judges and Democrat judges. So you know, we can have all sorts of assumptions about their you know, biases and preferences and, and objectives that explain their average degree of severity. And of course, that is part of the explanation, right? It is true that if you take all the cases that were given to those judges and you take the average of the sentence that they give across all the cases, some judges have a higher average and others have a lower average. So that's what we call level noise. It's the difference in the average level of judgment. Mm -hmm. And you find this everywhere. If you look at how professors are grading their students, left to their own devices, some professors will give higher averages than others, which is why many universities have rules that say, you know, you need to have a certain distribution of grades so that there, we, we don't create an inequality between students, depending on what professor they happen to be graded by. Or that's also what you see in a lot of companies where performance appraisals are supposed to abide by a certain predetermined distribution, because otherwise some evaluators would have higher levels of evaluation and others would have lower levels. So mm -hmm. that's a fairly simple thing to wrap your mind around. It's easy to understand. It's also relatively easy to fix, as those examples illustrate. It is not, however, the largest source of difference in the study of judges by far. Because here's the thing. This, you know, when, when different judges rank different cases, not, not when they give the sentences, but if you look at how they rank the different cases from the one that deserves the most severe punishment to the one that deserves the least severe punishment, their ranking is not going to be the same. You might, you might be more severe than me on average, but maybe, although I'm generally more lenient than you, I'm especially tough on people who are repeat offenders with the traffic laws. Maybe that really gets on my nerves, mm -hmm. or that reminds me of some really horrible case in which I made a bad decision. I don't want to make that bad decision again. Or maybe you are more severe than me on average, but you're relatively lenient compared to other judges when it comes to white collar offenders because they are not violent and yeah, it's not great. And of course we should punish them, but it's not the same thing as robbing a bank. And you know, that's your taste. And that's my taste. We are different people. We have different tastes. We have different preferences. In other words, we're going to have. So this is, this is a, this is stable exactly. heterogeneity. This is a, which a different has pattern. nothing to do with kind of exactly. average. It's a different pattern of judgment yeah. between people. We call this pattern noise because it reflects the pattern of judgments that different people are going to have. It really is their personality. We, we might just as well call it their judgment personality. People are going to have different judgments because they are different. And as soon as something is not codified in a very precise way where you're applying a formula, as soon as you leave some room for judgment, that judgment is going to be colored by my experiences, my prejudices, my biases, my beliefs, my knowledge or my ignorance, the previous experiences that I've had or the previous experiences that I haven't had. It's going to be me and your judgments are going to be you. Mm -hmm. And there is not much we can do about that. That's the pattern of judgment. And then there's a third type. Now, would, if, would, would, we, would we include sort of idiosyncratic biases 
as part Absolutely. of pattern noise. So to get back to Absolutely. the earlier example, if someone is 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 prejudiced in favor of female applicants and the other one is is prejudiced in favor of male applicants, that would show up it as, would, as pattern more, noise. More right? precisely, differences in those biases would show up as pattern noise. So if on average in the company everybody is biased in favor mm, of right. men and against women, and you are one person in the company who is biased in the opposite direction or or who is in fact unbiased, that will create pattern noise as a, as a difference from the average of the, of the company, which isn't in this example, a source of error. It would mm. in fact reduce the average error compared to a normative, uh, true answer, but in fact it would show up as, as noise in the analysis. And then there is a third source of noise, which the study of federal judges does mm. not show because they were only shown the case once, but if you show the same case to the same judge. And they don't actually remember the case, so they can't try to maintain their own consistency, as you were uh, alluding to earlier. They are going to be in disagreement with themselves. Some of the most striking examples of this come from forensic science, where if you show fingerprint examiners a pair of prints that they have looked at some weeks or some months earlier, and you don't tell them that these are prints that they have already examined and that they have judged to be a match, for instance, they will sometimes say, well, actually, this one is not a match. And if they had judged it to not be a match, they will sometimes say, well, actually, it might be a match. So in, 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 in a significant fraction of cases, there are judgments are going to change from one occasion to the next. We also know, for instance, that um, in, in, in things like medicine, where you have a lot of data that you can analyze and where you, where you can build big econometric models to understand the, the effect of extraneous factors on decisions. We know that some extraneous factors have big impacts or you know, not big, but significant impacts. We know the temperature has a different, uh, ha has an effect on decisions. We know the time of the day has an effect on decisions. We know the sequence of cases that you've looked at just before the case you're looking at now has an effect on your decision. So we are. We, we, we are instruments of judgments. Our minds are instruments of judgments. Those instruments are not completely stable. They are not completely consistent. We're not completely consistent with ourselves all the time. We think we are, especially when we're making only one judgment. We can't imagine that at a different time, in a different mood, in a different temperature, or if our favorite football team had lost the game yesterday instead of winning it, we would make a different decision. Yet all those things are true. We would be sensitive to some degree to all those factors. So we have level noise, we have pattern noise, and we have occasion noise. And the sum of those three things is a lot of noise. So in business schools, we, we spend a lot of time trying to help uh, people make better decisions. We also try to help organizations make, make better decisions. And, you know, when you're, when you're looking at how organizations make decisions, it's, it's different from how individuals make decisions. And in, in our classes, right? We'll, we'll teach individuals, uh, separately from how we'll teach organizations. And I think in part, because, um, you know, individuals think that they can fix themselves kind of more easily than they can fix organizations. And, uh, maybe one of the reasons why people are so attracted to the literature on, on bias is because we can kind of run them through these self diagnostics and, and at least offer them the hope of, of becoming kind of better decision makers. And I, I've run, you know, a lot of these kind of workshops and classes for, for individuals. So if occasion noise is something which is specific to, um, to individuals, um, how can individuals try to overcome this? And, and I, I found, you know, your review of some of the older studies, super interesting about how, if you were to simply, um, create a, a model of one's own decision-making, right? You could, and, you know, whip out that model, that kind of autopilot, which is kind of created out of your prior decision-making, you'll wind up making decisions with less noise than if you allow yourself as an individual to actually make those decisions in, in the moment. Um, what are some of the techniques that, that individuals can use to try to kind of minimize the amount of, of occasion uh, noise. And, and those studies, by the way, all the other studies describing how, 
you know, sunshine <laughs> influences your decisions and, you know, hunger uh, influences your decisions. And when you find out that your doctor, his main, his or her main criteria for sending you over for further examination is, you know, whether he's hungry or she's hungry or the time of day, you know, those things are incredibly disturbing when you think yeah. about how much education lawyers and doctors and judges go through to ultimately decide based on whether well, they've had the, a donut or not. It's not the main not, factor. Uh, I mean, we, we, we should not, not imply that, disturbing. you know, that, 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 that doctors or judges are completely random. They're not, thank God. Right. I mean, they, 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 they are sensitive to things that they should not be sensitive to in an ideal world because we all are, but the, these occasion noise factors are not as large as some of the other sources of noise. So what can you do about that? Well, the first thing you can do, and, and specifically this will target occasion noise, which is fairly easy to do, is the old, uh, the, the, the age old advice to sleep on it. If you simply take the average of your judgments at two different points in time, and you can let enough time pass that you will mm -hmm. either have forgotten your initial judgment or you will have attained some distance from it, the average of the two judgments that you make will be somewhat better than your first impression, um, which is sort of within person version of the, the wisdom of crowds principle, where if you take the average of a number of different people, you're going to reduce the noise between those people. Now, if you're on your own, you're asking me about individual decision making, you can create what, um, some authors have called a crowd within, uh, which is, you know, a number of different instances of yourself at mm -hmm. different points in time where you're going to take the average of those different judgments. And that's going to be a bit better than your first impression. That's one way. Now, there is a more powerful way, which is the one you were alluding to when you were talking about the, the model of the judge, which will reduce not only occasion noise, but also some of the pattern noise, some of the, the, the idiosyncratic preferences that you might have. And that's to say, you know, if, I'm, if, if I have to, uh, you know, suppose you have to uh, decide between a number of candidates uh, who have been evaluated on a number of dimensions. So you have 10 candidates and for each of them, you have an assessment, an, an assessment of their technical skills, of their fit with the corporate culture, of their motivation for the job and so on and so forth. And the typical way that any of us is going to do this is going to look at each of the candidates and to say, okay, so this is Gregory. Oh. Yes, I remember Gregory has extremely high intelligence, moderate motivation for this job because he's very happy in what he's doing now, um, ex extremely good interpersonal skills, not so great on something else. My overall judgment of Gregory is this. And then I move on to the next candidate and I do the same thing again. When I do this, I'm introducing my idiosyncratic preferences in terms of you know, who do I like and who do I not like. I'm also introducing my own mm -hmm. weights that I give to the different dimensions, which aren't necessarily the weights that someone else in the organization would give mm -hmm. to those different dimensions. And the result is that I'm adding a lot of noise when I think that I'm adding subtlety. I think that I'm making a case by case judgment and that applying a single one size fits all rule to all those candidates mm -hmm. would be silly. But in fact, there is a lot of evidence that applying a one size fits all rule to all these candidates would overall produce a better result than my case by case judgment. So that's very hard for people to, to, to accept because we all believe that our ability to integrate information is superior to the ability of a very simple rule or even the ability of a sophisticated model. We all think that we're very good at looking at a case looking at, especially when the case is a person and forming an overall impression of that person, it turns out that we are not that good at it because we do it in a very noisy way. The way to improve our judgment when we're doing something like that is to look at those dimensions separately, as separately as we can, in the same way that a rule or a formula or a model would. And only then, only after you have looked at those dimensions separately to try to 
form a holistic judgment of the case and to let your intuition give you the final conclusion. The trick is not to let your intuition affect your judgment too early. I'm not saying do not let your intuition affect your judgment at all because that's mm -hmm. unrealistic. You, you will need your intuition to come to a judgment and your intuition will come into play at some point. It's better if you can delay it than if you use it at the beginning of the process. So this process of structuring your, your decisions using some kind of checklist or kind of uh, reflectively designed um, framework, this re reminded me of what we used to learn in school, you know, 30 years ago, the, the analytic hierarchy process, right? Um, it, it's it's kind of, it's very similar to that, right? Although I think when we, we talked about that back in the day, it was, it was something that, that organizations would use for, for things like, like interviews. And, and I think you said that best practices in the world of, of hiring now, uh, include this type of, of structuring of the interviews. And you suggest that we think of, uh, cases uh, and options as, as interviews, right? We think of options. So when we're as a business deciding upon, you know, should we make this acquisition or not? You're saying we should look at that decision the same way we would look at a decision related to recruiting a new employee. And, and we know a lot about recruiting new, new employees. Um, and we've, we've developed some best practices around recruiting new employees. So why not extend those best practices to, to other decisions that companies make? That's the idea. And you know, when, when you talk about the classic, uh, decision-making techniques and, um, and, and decision science recommendations, the, the logic there goes a bit further than, than we do here. We, we stop short of that logic. Here's what we don't do. The, the logic of decision science, of you know, the, the, the classic decision science recommendation would be, you know, rate your candidates on the four dimensions that matter to you, and then apply some sort of formula that gives a predetermined weight mm -hmm. to each of those dimensions, and that will give you a score, and the candidates who gets the highest score should be hired. Uh, and the same could apply to any strategic decision that you're making. You're looking at three companies you could buy, you know, rate company a company b and company c on the three four five or seven things that matter to you give the appropriate weights to those things that matter to you and that will tell you what your decision should be and you can refine and sophisticate this in any way you want now the, there is many practical problems with this but the, the main practical problem is that when you actually do this with real people in real organizations mm -hmm. they will reverse engineer the, the grades that they are giving to each mm -hmm. of the dimensions to get to the answer that they have holistically decided that they want to arrive at because they don't want their freedom of choice to be taken away from them. Mm -hmm. So if you tell me you know, the, the, the choice of the candidate will be determined by you know, this formula and I want to hire this candidate, I'm going to give the candidate the grades that it takes to hire the candidate. And if I don't want to hire the candidate, I'm going to give the candidates the grades that it takes not to uh, hire the candidate. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do instead is to equip people with a way of thinking about the problem where they are going to consider those dimensions separately. And we explicitly do not say that there is going to be a formula that adds up those dimensions. We say this is a judgment. This remains a judgment. The purpose of structuring mm -hmm. the judgment is to help you arrive at a better judgment. It's not to replace the human judgment with the automated judgment of a formula that just adds up numbers. And that's an important distinction because it leaves people in the position of actually making the decision. It leaves them in the position of using their intuition, using their gut feeling to gain confidence in the decision that they're making, which is something that they need because they are going to have to live with the consequences of that decision. But it encourages them to do that only after they have gone through the steps of gathering the data, evaluating the data, in independently scoring the data that they have on the different dimensions of evaluation, and only when that is done to use their intuition. Right, so you're not completely dismissive of, of intuition, even though I think in, in the book, uh, you're about to make a terrible mistake. You uh, at least start the book out with um, 
uh, a description of um, the the intuitive business leader, which is a little bit scary, um, you know. And I think that you could make the case in the book Noise that um, algorithmic decision making or using machine learning is in many ways right uh, uh, vastly superior to the kind of decision making that we currently have it in in organizations. Um, but if you go to that extreme of automating all of the decisions uh, and and leaving human judgment out, is is the problem simply that you don't get buy in from the participants in the process, or is there there a possibility that you'll uh, leave out other essential characteristics of judgment? Before I answer that, let me come back to your point about intuition because there's there's an important distinction here. We are not against intuition. We're against early intuition. The problem with mm-hmm. the, the intuitive decision maker that I'm talking about in the, in you're about to make a terrible mistake is not that he or she uses their intuition. It's that they start from their intuition and then they justify everything that they're looking at to confirm their ingoing intuition because they start from the premise that their intuition can only be right because they are so great. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, there's a confusion. There's a frequent confusion between using your intuition and making a snap judgment at the beginning of the process. When we think mm-hmm. of um, intuition as described, for instance, by, by Malcolm Gladwell in Blink, uh, intuition is the very fast judgment that you make in a snap second. That's one form of intuition. The form of intuition that we talk about in noise is the intuition that comes at the end of the process after it's been informed by a lot of evidence. It's still intuition, but it's not a snap judgment. So that's an, an important distinction. Now, on um, sorry, what was your other question? <laughs> your, your real question? Well, I, I think that you know, as I'm, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of, of algorithmic decision making well, in many domains, yes. and I felt that in in the book, you you the the discussion was was deferred a bit, but but ultimately, you know, you you highlight a lot of the benefits of uh, automating decision making and yes. using sophisticated models like machine learning to uh, to you know back out decision rules that uh, reduce the amount of of noise. Yes, well. There is, you know, there is a lot of criticism of algorithms right now, and there is a backlash against algorithms for all kinds of good and bad reasons. But, you know, if we step back from the current climate, I think it's clear that there has been a lot more algorithmic decision-making in recent years than there was some decades ago. And the trend is clear. There will be more algorithmic decision-making. By the way, once it works and once we accept it, we wouldn't want to go back. You know, suppose that you call your bank and you say, mm-hmm. I want a consumer loan. And they tell you, well, we'd like you to come in for an interview with the, the branch manager so that the branch manager can make a judgment about your character and whether you're the sort of person we can trust to repay a consumer loan. You, know, you would say this bank is crazy. And that's probably a source of bias and discrimination that you know, should be avoided at all costs mm-hmm. because the bank now has an algorithm which is not perfect, but which at least is noise-free. It's going to give the same decision for two different people who are identically situated. Um, it's not going to at least overtly take into account things that it's not supposed to take into account. So you know, there are a lot of algorithms in use today that we think are good, both for the quality of decisions, for the unbiased uh, quality of decisions for the absence of discrimination and so on. Now, people are very worried about algorithms these days for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is bias, algorithmic bias. That's a very serious concern. And there is a lot of work on this topic. There is a lot of evidence that you know, organizations, both public and private, have been using algorithms that are based on data that reflects past biases, and therefore the algorithms are biased. To be clear, it's not because the people who design the algorithms are biased human beings or because they are selected from a biased group of human beings. It's because the data on which the algorithms are trained is itself the reflection of past biases. And so if you, to take an example that made the headlines, 
if you are Amazon and you ask an algorithm to tell you who is going to be successful at Amazon and you tell the algorithm who has been successful at Amazon in the past, and that turns out to be mostly men, the algorithm is going to do what, in fact, humans would do too, which is to say, well, it seems that in order to be successful in this company, it helps to be a man. And therefore, I'm going to select more men than women. Now, that's a problem. That's a problem that must be tackled. That, by the way, is a problem that is solvable. It's much easier to measure the bias of an algorithm and to reduce the bias of an algorithm than it is to measure or reduce the biases of human beings. You know, go figure whether Mr. X or Mrs. X, who is recruiting for Amazon, has a gender bias or not. How are you going to do that? Are you going to ask them to interview 10,000 candidates and measure their ratings? Well, it's quite difficult to do. You can do it with an algorithm. You can measure how biased the algorithm is, and then you can fix it if you want to. But it's quite hard to do for human beings. So algorithms may have biases. That's a real problem. It needs to be addressed. It can be addressed. It can be fixed. We have some evidence that there are biases in all the fields. There are al al algorithms in all the fields where we are concerned about the, the risk of algorithmic, uh, algorithmic bias that can be designed not to be biased, that can in fact address and reduce discrimination. That's a problem that exists, but that's a problem that can be solved. The problem that is very difficult to solve, though, is that we really don't like algorithms. We really don't like them. We are not prepared mm. to grant algorithms the benefit of the doubt that we give our fellow human beings. When, uh, you know, when, when, when a self-driving car has an accident and kills someone, we feel it's completely normal and, in fact, urgent to stop all the self-driving cars on the roads in America because we want to investigate how is it possible that a machine killed someone. Obviously, we don't apply the same standard to human beings. We don't stop all cars on all roads in, in the country whenever some, you know, some, some driver makes a mistake and kills someone, which unfortunately happens a lot. In fact, if we look at the record of those self-driving cars so far, it looks like it's much better than the record of human drivers. But we will not tolerate those cars on the road until their safety records is nearly perfect. We are not prepared to tolerate mistakes made by mm. algorithms. This is not an example of decision-making. This is an example of you know, uh, live operation, but the same would be true of any kind of decision aid. If we had an algorithm for uh, you know, judicial decisions, for some simple type of judicial decision, and that algorithm's made occasional mm -hmm. mistakes, which of course it will. It's very hard to be perfect <laughs> when, you, when you're dealing with humans and with, with predictions. You know, those the errors are going to look silly to us and they are going to be intolerable, whereas the, the errors of human beings are going to look like errors that we could make too, because we're human beings, and are a fact of life when we're mm -hmm. dealing with humans. I was, you know, I, I, I was speaking at a conference a few days ago, and uh, someone asked me, oh, but what about killer drones? Are you, are you saying that algorithms in killer drones are tolerable instead of having some human being who, who oversees the machinery and who is able to stop the drone before it kills someone. To be clear, I'm not in favor of drones killing people, you know, either in an automated or in a human activated way. But it's interesting that the idea of a machine deciding by itself to go kill someone is completely abhorrent, including to me. And the idea that there is some human being sitting somewhere 10,000 miles away who is probably jet lagged and tired making that decision. And the idea that that individual would make a different decision from the individual sitting next to him in the same bank of computers because there is noise in their judgments, that's fine. Now, we, we obviously are not applying the same standard here. I'm taking an extreme example intentionally to to dramatize it a bit, you know, we obviously it's 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 horrifying to think of machines deciding or you know applying the decision we've made to kill people. It should be just as horrifying to think that people are making the decision to kill 
some target. And that the human judgment of those people is noisy, but somehow we can't work up the same outrage for the latter as we do for the former. So all of this, I think, will be much harder to change and will take much longer to change than, than, than it takes to solve the problem of algorithmic bias. For those reasons, I think we will be, for a long time, wary of algorithms for important decisions. And that's why we wrote a book about how to improve human judgment, not about how to replace it with algorithmic decision-making. We, we are you know, worried, or, or not worried, but we are convinced that a lot of very important decisions are going to remain human decisions. And we are worried that if we don't improve them, they are not going to be much better. So we should improve them, not wait until everything becomes algorithmic, because it won't. But, but I, I think the problem is bigger, as you articulate in the book. It's not that people simply object to machines making decisions, but they object to humans making decisions according to rigid rules, right? So all efforts to eliminate noise will necessarily require the administration of, of rules, right? And elimination of, of some amount of individual discretion. And, and I think people object to this for two reasons. I think the decision makers object to it because it, it's stripping some of their autonomy and, and authority away, but, but also uh, the people on, on the receiving end, right? When they find out that they've been, you know, sentenced for a crime uh, and they've been sentenced according to, to a formula where the person who's eyes they're looking at is just following a, you know, a, a checklist rather than looking at them as human beings and, and, and looking into their eyes and, and considering them as, as, as individuals. I think that seems to be one of the big objections. And in our, in our law, we, we value, right. We, we value due process, but we, we also value equal protection. And it seems like the elimination of noise is in the service of equal protection, but the due process idea requires that all of the idiosyncrasies of the, of the individual be, be taken in, into consideration. Now, I think an, an algorithm actually does a better job of, of incorporating all of the, the, the idiosyncrasies, right? You mentioned kind of the, the yeah, broken I'm leg well, principle, right? That, that is like an exception to a rule. Algorithms are probably better at that. I think we're making a confusion when we're talking about um, due process and, um, and, and attention to the individual. There is some confusion between the idea that each person is owed you know, the, the dignity of a consideration of the, the specifics of his, of his or her case, which is clear and indisputable, and that is due process, and each person deserves a fair hearing and so on. But I'm not aware that due process says anywhere that the idiosyncratic characteristics of the judge should be reflected in the final decision. So you know, we, we, we somehow equate the, the idea that we should pay attention to the specifics of each case with the idea that therefore we have to live with the specifics of each judge. These are two very different things, right? Now, if you, if you lose that distinction and you say we want to eliminate noise, you will do very silly things like mandatory sentences or uniform sentences. If you say, you know, anybody who's committed three felonies goes to jail for life, for instance, you know, that's a noise reduction measure because anybody who's committed three felonies will go to jail for life. But it's a very rough, simplistic way of reducing noise, which in my view, at least doesn't make much sense. You could say there is a mandatory sentence for anyone who commits crime X, Y, or Z of X years. Um, and that would also be a way to reduce noise, but it would violate many of the principles that we've talked about of taking into account the specifics of each case. So we should not confuse these two things, the, the need to reduce noise and the, and, 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 and the need for each case to be individually uh, treated and for each person to be given a fair hearing and, and be treated with dignity. There is, there are ways to cons 
reconcile those two objectives and to have some, for instance, guidelines that give judges some leeway and in, in fact even give them the ability to diverge from the guidelines provided that they can justify it, but that at least give some coherence, some convergence between the judges um, and, 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 and are proven to reduce the noise. This is tricky. I mean, it's not, it's not something where you can say, here's a simple one-size-fits-all rule. When the U.S. did this, the, the Sentencing Commission spent a lot of time looking at the history of how various crimes had been sentenced and defining 43, I think, parameters that uh, needed to be taken into account. So, you know, these aren't simplistic guidelines. If you had a guideline that said every doctor in the hospital should give aspirin to everybody who comes in with any kind of pain, you know, that would reduce noise, but it would be very silly. You, you, you don't have to be simplistic in the guidelines that you set. You can have sophisticated guidelines and you can have guidelines that take into account as many aspects of a given case as you, as, as you want to and as you decide to. What you do not want to take into account in the guidelines are what is specific to any individual judge. The preferences, the biases, the tastes of every judge do not need to be reflected. And when you, you pointed out that individuals who make those decisions are, you know, are, are, are reluctant to see their power stripped away from them, that is sometimes the case. But if you do this the right way and you explain to people that this actually produces better decisions, it doesn't have to be that way. The prime example is medicine. We haven't talked about medicine yet, but there are a lot of guidelines in medicine that improve the quality of decisions. And most doctors actually abide by the guidelines, not because they like their freedom of judgment to be taken away from them, but because they realize that it does not take their freedom of judgment away from them. It mm -hmm. assists their judgment and it helps them to make better clinical decisions. A striking example that has saved countless lives is the Abgar score, which is used when babies are born. It used mm -hmm. to be a matter of judgment for uh, a nurse or a midwife or, or a doctor to look at the baby and to say, yeah, this baby is fine. Oh yeah, this baby doesn't look so good. Let's send this baby into neonatal uh, ICU. And it's now not a judgment that is made in this way. It's a judgment that is made based on a formula and a score where you add up um, a, a number of you know, zero to two scores on a number of different dimensions. That reduces the noise considerably and doctors do it because they realize that it improves the quality of their judgment. So there is hope, I think, for, for reducing noise. If you can uh, help professionals mm -hmm. find those kinds of guidelines, structure judgments in, in those kinds of way, and help them see that it actually improves the quality of their judgments, and therefore the outcomes for what they care about. They are patients, if they are uh, doctors, justice, if they are uh, judges, quality of decision if they are working in a corporation, and so on. And one of the metaphors that you use in the book, which I really like, is this idea of decision hygiene, and, and you analogize it to kind of hand washing, right? And how uh, hospitals had to uh, take, you know, go to great lengths to try and get behavioral change from from doctors, uh, and and it wasn't simply about. Um, changing individual behavior, but understanding the process and, and the, the collective rules in place that led to these changes in behavior. And you advocate for, um, decision hygiene within, within organizations. Um, and presumably the starting point for that would be a noise audit, right? Um, and yeah. so how can an organization do, do a noise audit or what would prompt them to do this? I mean, normally when something bad happens, you do maybe a post-mortem if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, a well-functioning organization. But when we do these post-mortems, we're always kind of looking for the cause, right? And so, oh, well, this one person made this bad decision or, uh, you know, we, we, we have some, some causal story, which might cause us to overlook, uh, the, 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 the noise that's in, in the process. How does a noise audit work? Well, noise is a problem without a cause. Noise is a problem that is, you know, in the system that is unexplained. And therefore you can't wait for a problem to happen to look for noise because you won't find noise. You will find 
someone who made a mistake, if that's what you're looking for, you will find a cause. Now, you would want to do a noise audit preventively as a way to improve the quality of your decision making. That's why we call this decision hygiene. It's a preventive measure. It's like washing your hands. If it's successful, you will never know what germ you eliminated. You will not know mm -hmm. what disease you would have had if you hadn't washed your hands. That's kind of frustrating, isn't it? You know, why keep washing your hands if you never actually see the benefit of it? Well, it's a good habit that you need to take. Likewise, decision hygiene, the measures that reduce noise, are good habits that you need to take without ever seeing the benefit that they, that, that they give you. The only way you will see it is if you, from time to time, do a noise audit and you ask your various professionals who are making decisions that are comparable to compare the judgments that they're making on identical cases by doing an experiment, what we call a noise audit, basically give the same case to two different people or three different people or 10 different people and measure the extent of their disagreements. If you've been successful at putting in place some decision hygiene practices, for instance, giving them guidelines, helping them structure their judgments, making sure that they use independent assessments on different dimensions, encouraging them to aggregate the points of view of multiple different people in their judgments, you will see that you are reducing from one noise audit to the next, that you're reducing the amount of noise in your decisions. And you can rest assured that this actually improves the quality of the outcomes in your organization. Well, look, we didn't have time to really even scratch the surface of this book, Noise, which is really a tremendous book. I think you could build an entire uh, course around it. I think you could build an entire doctoral program uh, around it. It's really a wonderful book. Uh, and I also think this book, you're about to make a terrible mistake, which we didn't even get into, uh, is fantastic. And it offers um, about, I don't know, 30 techniques, 40 techniques for, for how to improve decision-making. And what's what I found most useful here is that most of those techniques are around collective decision-making within organizations and how to promote diversity of opinion, which will ultimately lead to better decision-making at the end of the day. And I think I'm going to incorporate this into, into my teaching as well. And of course we barely scratched. We didn't even talk about this one, cracked it, which I think is, is, is really useful, really interesting. And I'll uh, be sure to recommend that to my students as well. Well, I hope we get another chance. Thank you so much for the invitation and thanks for the kind words. I'm glad you liked the book and you, I, I am planning to teach a course from it, so I'm, I'm glad that you think there is a course in it. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. <laughs>